Hello and welcome. Uh, today we have a very special guest, Dr. Jeff Gaski. Uh, Dr. Uh, Gaski, he's an MD, SACEP, who, and he's a board certified emergency physician now on the front lines against COVID-19. Dr. Gaski is also a renowned National Geographic photographer and explorer. His discoveries and photographs are now featured in the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Uh, Dr. Gusky was the first fine art photographer to go behind the former Iron Curtain and document a hidden world of the Holocaust. His work has been covered by the New York Times, the Washington Post, National Geographic, NBC, Fox, ABC, CBS, PBS, NPR, BBC, USA Today, and a huge long list, which I don't want to, which I would love to share. I will put it in the show notes, but uh, he has been recognized the, uh, around the globe. Uh, he has written three books hosted and co-produced the television documentary, Americans Underground, Secret City of World War I, which premiered on the Smithsonian Channel uh, in 2017. Uh, and his list of accomplishments goes on and on, but I really want to introduce you and talk about some interesting stuff. So welcome, Dr. Gaski. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm so glad to be with you, and I hope that you're safe and that your audience is safe. Yes, yes. So far, so good. Let's see how it goes. Um, but I would love to uh, learn a little bit more about you. You have done some interesting work. Um, and I think uh, your experience with uh, you know, going uh, and documenting World War I uh, may be relevant to the current times. We'll, we'll certainly talk about that. But before that, I'd love to know a little bit more about you. you know, how, how did you get here? What is your story? And uh, I, I'm sure you have lots to share. Well, uh, I, I feel kind of, uh, thank you for the great introduction, but I just feel like I'm an ordinary person and uh, I've been very fortunate and I follow my gut. And and so I tend to gravitate towards front lines and frontiers and we're all now on a front line. And there are many, many lessons that uh, we can take away from this experience that are positive. And I want to say that I am very, very hopeful about the future. That's great. That's great. All right. So um, let's start with with uh, drawing some parallels. You know, we were talking about uh, this before the interview. Um, what are the parallels you see between the current situation we are in and other extreme events that the world has experienced? You know, Holocaust and World War One and all that. Okay. First of all, I believe that everything has an overlay of fear right now and uncertainty and the uh the media uh adds to this greatly so yes this is a crisis yes we're all going through a constant barrage of fear on media but having walked the ground of eastern europe western europe and the former soviet union where millions have been murdered in modern times. I can tell you that this is nothing like what other people have been through in modern times and, and uh, been able to rebound tremendously well. So we have internet, we have electricity, we have uh, hospital and fire and police and food and uh, the infrastructure is, is very intact. The thing that's killing us is the uncertainty. And, and we're fighting a war against an enemy that's invisible. And that drives us all crazy. And so there are some things we can talk about as we go into the interview that will help people with that. But I just want people to feel hopeful because as bad as it seems, it's nothing like what people have been through until now. And, and it doesn't, our world isn't falling apart. There, there's much more that is intact and that that is going to get us through than than the opposite and and most of that has to do with each other there's a saying that i love which is that when the power of the modern world disappears all we have left is each other and i think that's what we're really seeing in these times because suddenly our lives reconnect to what's real in a heartbeat we we discover meaning and purpose that we forgot that we had. We, we shatter numbness because all of us has a purpose in protecting others from ourselves if we should get sick and in making sacrifices and staying indoors and, and in, in 
uh, watching when we cough or you know not you know being being re socially responsible and that gives our life meaning and purpose and then we also appreciate the little things so much because we're alone we're isolated and so a little smile a little thank you a little gesture of making another human being feel safe is really felt by others and, and we feel it when people are when we say thank you or someone says thank you to us it just brightens our day and, and that's what these times do for us we reconnect to what's human and what's real yeah so absolutely true and i completely agree with you uh, about the situation we are in like you know we have faced uh, much worse situations uh, with much less resources uh, at our hands and as you said like you know communication and and proximity and and uh, uh, access to information uh, is the key and in in the events that you mentioned none of that was there you know basic necessities water food was not there even though we have some problems i think um i think if we if we just go through history and learn from the lessons that history gives us i think we are in much better shape and uh, we are and to your point uh, you know small little things like when we were um, running around, you know, trying to uh, trying to uh, get that next promotion, get, you know, trying to uh, close that uh, big deal, uh, it's kind of hard to notice these small gestures. Kind of hard to slow down and, and notice what is really important. But now, you know, right now, for example, I'm sitting with my shirt, but underneath, I, I have, uh, you know, I can wear whatever I want. I, I it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, I spend more time with my family, so. You're absolutely right. You know, these times uh, help us to um, look at what is more important. So, in your view, and I, I want to mention a few things here, uh, which I really want to talk about: viral bombs and viral safety index. Uh, what are these, and how can we use these uh, to understand what is going on? Okay, let me start big picture and say that. And I was thinking as we prepared for uh, the interview today, uh, I know that that you're. Uh, show is about bootstrapping and and helping people um, find innovation and, and inspiration to succeed and and so I'm now on a big frontier and it's frightening I'm pushing a boulder up a hill and it has to do with COVID and it's it's perhaps an example of the kinds of things that you like to talk about in the audience is interested in so I believe that that the missing link in the COVID picture is something that is right under our nose. We can all do it. It's so simple, you can't believe it. And for reasons that I do not understand, the scientists are not actively talking about it. It's bizarre because the science has been there for a long time. And, and so I feel a responsibility as, as a, a medical doctor and frontline person who also has access to media to to be a provocateur and to shake things up and to get people to realize that there was this missing link. So let me share it with you. In fact, there's a, there's a podcast that everyone should listen to. It's a 60 second science podcast in 2009, Scientific American called Humidity Helps Fight Flu. And it tells us that that with regard to the airborne spread of viral disease, that we had been looking at the wrong metrics for a long time. So when we think humidity, we think relative humidity, which is what is reported on the Weather Service. And that has very little correlation between viral spread of disease and, uh, uh, and, uh, flu and humidity. So the, the bottom line is that, that um, I had an experience six years ago when we had the Ebola outbreak in Dallas. One of my best friend's brothers was sitting across from me at a family dinner, and he told me, you know, Jeff, they're looking at the wrong thing, that there's something that happened on the days when those two nurses got infected, and everyone who lives in this area knows about that because it was all over the news. Everyone was frightened. He said they were red days. Well, this friend's brother is a genius electrical engineer that designs indoor air sensors for hospitals around the world and gets millions of data points every day via the cloud. And he has a model to look at indoor air quality inside buildings. And he said that one, that the indoor air quality is completely different. The physics of, of airborne spread of viral diseases 
is totally different indoors versus outdoors. That's one. And he said that on the days these two nurses were infected, they were red days, meaning the air was uncharacteristically dry. And so that started the wheels turning. And I remembered that. And I saw him about two and a half months ago, two mo something like that. And I said, what's up with Wuhan? And he said, his name is Rick. He said, same thing. And he's tracked every viral outbreak, whether it's uh, the first SARS or Ebola or uh, MERS. Or, and they all have the same pattern. The only thing is that with, with uh, COVID-19, we've never had a virus that is so infective that can shut down entire nations. And so what, what I think is going to happen, it's just a matter of time, is that people around the, the world realize, and this is gonna sound crazy, I love to say this. In America, we have this, uh, there's a political saying from one of the elections, it's the economy stupid, invented by James Carville. And I love to say, it's the weather, stupid. <laughs> it's the weather. The weather is what makes the difference between why COVID is bad in one place and not so bad in another. It, it's the difference between why we had the hospitals filling up in the winter time and then they, they started emptying out in the spring. And they'll continue that way through the summer. It's not that you can't get COVID in the summer, but in terms of mass spread, um, it's a disease of, of dangerously dry indoor air. So here's where I'm going with this, and here's where hope lies. Right now, the weather services do not report this metric that can forecast dangerously dry indoor air. And I'm on a mission pushing the boulder up the hill to get what's called the viral safety index on every weather report every day around the world, around the clock. But until that happens, each of you can make invisible danger visible by simply buying a cheap digital hygrometer. Here in the US, you can get them for 10 or $12 on Amazon or Walmart or any number of places. And they will give you situational awareness about the relative safety of the air indoors against COVID. Because when it's moist, when it's in this range that I call green air, which is a relative humidity, of 50 to 60%, COVID doesn't do well. It doesn't go very far, it doesn't last very long. And then a, a big factor, uh, and it may be the most important factor, is that we are less susceptible to COVID when the air we breathe is moist. And here's why, because we have a natural protective barrier that starts at the tip of our nose and mouth and goes all the way into our lungs and I call it Kevlar against COVID. You know, the, the military Kevlar vests, that, the bulletproof vests that protect soldiers and policemen from bullets entering their body. Well, we have a natural protective barrier that prevents COVID bullets from getting into our body, but it has to be moist to work. So it involves the mucous membranes that start right here and here and go all the way down into our lungs. What's on mucous membranes, but mucus. It's optimized when it's moist. It's impaired when it's dry. Think about when you're up in an airplane. At altitude, the humidity, the relative humidity is 10 to 15%. And people often talk about getting sick. And, and I believe the reason is that the Kevlar against COVID, the mucous membranes dry out and pathogens uh, get in because when it's dry, it cracks and the bugs get in. When it's moist, they, we have this natural protection. And so just by buying a simple home humidifier and buying a cheap digital hygrometer and keeping it 24 seven until the crisis is passed between 50 and 60%, I believe you can make invisible danger visible and then you can make that invisible danger safe. Isn't that cool? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. Now. Um, one can say, you know, obviously this is something that everybody can do and I highly recommend. Um, now, how do we, how do we reconcile this with some data? Like, you know, India, for example, is a warm country and even though they have a huge population, uh, luckily exactly. they have... Exactly. Yeah. So how... Exactly. Are, That's a perfect example. Yeah. So, so can you help us reconcile that? You know, is it because of uh, the humidity? Is it because of the heat or... 
No, no, it's not. It's there's maybe some little correlation with the heat, but but it's principally another metric. It's not relative humidity. It's a it's a metric that measures the amount of water in the air, and it's invisible. And when it's in a, a certain range that approximates what would be relative humidity indoors of fifty to sixty percent, the the virus just doesn't do very well. It's that's the COVID weak spot. And it, it doesn't go very far. So when you look at hum India, that's a perfect example. I'm so glad that you brought that up, Manoush, because look at India with how many hundreds of millions of people or how many, what's the population? 1.3 billion. Okay, 1.3 billion. And how many deaths have they had? Almost nothing. And it's impossible to socially distance in India. And, and all the things, and yet, yet they're not getting it. It's not going crazy. And it's because... When you look at the charts of India, when you look at uh, Singapore and, and Taiwan and Hong Kong, they have a, uh, almost year round, they have a very high amount of moisture in the air outdoors. Now, why does that impact the air indoors? Because buildings breathe, buildings breathe. And when you look at not relative humidity, but this other metric, it can for, the outdoor weather can forecast the indoor viral danger and that's what the viral safety index is about to get people a forecast a warning of dangerously dry indoor air in advance so they can make red air green so they can pre protect themselves and their families and their employees and their patients and the prisoners and the meat packing plants and the nursing home patients all of these people uh, against danger that may happen in the middle of the night it can happen in the middle of the summer it can happen, you know, it's because crazy weather patterns can change without us realizing it. Here's a great, okay, let me make another point. Yeah. If you look at Florida, Florida was supposed to be uh, an apocalypse because they have the highest concentration of elderly people in the United States. And as we know, uh, elderly people have a higher risk of yeah. COVID and they have higher uh, comorbidities. So, it, it, it was just the opposite. And, and a great deal of it was because of the amazing leadership of the governor who proactively protected the nursing homes. And, um, uh, but, but I believe a lot of it was because Florida weather is a lot closer to India than New York. The, the outside uh, uh, amount of water in the air makes the indoor air safer, even in air conditioned uh, environments inside. So, so it's it's the weather, stupid. Not you, Manoush, but I'm just saying that to the politicians. It's the weather, stupid. And once we realize that, why is that important? It's because it gives us hope. It gives us a sense of clarity that not all the places in the in the United States or in the world are equally at risk. A lot of places have a very low risk of COVID, and 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 for those places that have a high risk, they can make their indoor air low risk very easily, very simply. Wouldn't that be amazing if we could, all of us could, could have a way of, of staying safe, even at the peak of, of risk, like when the flu season comes back in the fall? Yeah, yeah. yeah no, that's true. Uh, and thanks a lot for sharing that. Now, uh, you lead, led me into the next question. So how this will change, like, obviously, you know, nobody can tell the future, but in your opinion, how will this change as the weather sort of changes into fall and winter? Um, it, it could get very bad again. It could get, and, and I'm hoping, you know, as, as an emergency physician, we take patients and families on a journey through darkness to light and always towards hope. And it's a journey that begins with seeing danger clearly so you can see it and avoid it. And so I always try to frame things in a hopeful light. And, and that's very, very important. And I am truly hopeful. I, I feel it in my heart about the future. And I think we're going to do much better than we think. It's not going to be easy. And we're going to have some rough spots along the way. But in answer to your question, so in the Northern Hemisphere, we have uh, from the winter, we have red, more red days. Then the spring, it starts to go green. And by the summer, we have more, many more green days than red. You can have dry, uh, dry air in the summer that's dangerous, and that's why the viral safety index is so important. But in by and large, we're going to have 
less COVID as we move into the summer. The problem will be as we go back into the fall in the Northern Hemisphere, it's going to get risky again. Now, we're not going to have a vaccine in all likelihood and at least until next year. And so what's the other scenario? Well, sometimes viruses burn out and fingers crossed it will burn out. But I think there's a very uh, significant risk that COVID could come back with a vengeance in the fall. We need to be prepared for it. And, and it's, it's, it's absolutely wrong for politicians to, uh, to scare us and to, for the media to do fear mongering and to constantly batter us with, with fear and with uncertainty because a lot of it is just made up. It's not true. And this is one of my recommendations. When you hear numbers bandied about, like for example, the perfect example, in the last several days, we've heard numbers in Texas about you know peak numbers you know that we haven't seen before um and and it's scaring the heck out of people well what they haven't told you in the news uh, is something that i know as a physician because the state sent out mandates several days ago requiring every physician every facility whether inpatient or outpatient a doc in the box a small clinic or a large hospital they all have to report all of their testing positive or negative to the state. So now all of a sudden, the state is getting a lot of data they didn't get before. And it looks like to news media that is exploiting this, it, they can say, oh yeah, we have the, these big numbers now. They're not saying why. That's one example. There are so many examples of exploitation and, and manipulation. And we just have to kind of tune it down. We have to realize we are in the fog of war. Now, for those of you don't, that don't know what that means, it, it, it goes back to I, I, maybe World War I, I'm not sure, but it's when you're in the midst of a war, nothing makes sense. It's like, you know, you're overwhelmed and you just have to sometimes put one foot in front of the other, in front of the other, and tune out the uncertainty and realize, you know, you pinch yourself you, you, or, you, or you give a hug to a friend or a loved one or you know, that, that what matters is just your, that you're here, you're safe, and those around you are, are here and safe, and you just let it go. You have to deal with uncertainty and realize that, that all these illusions about perfection in modern life, we throw them out the window. We're used to technology having all the answers. And that's why I said the saying earlier, when the power of the modern world disappears, all we have left is each other. That's what World War I taught us. It was, it was a confrontation with these myths about progress because people were living in cities and they were, they were exhilarated by all of the modern developments you know, that made life so fast and stimulating and modern and, and efficient. And, and they came to believe that it would, the party would go on forever and that, that technology was almost like a... Um, a force of goodness that could never end. And then we realized that it has limits. And, and the technology actually also has a dark side, which is what World War I was about because it was the first modern mass destruction. And, and so when, when technology is allowed to go crazy without human control and without humanity, it's very, very dangerous. And the only thing we can count on is each other. And we, we, we have to realize that human nature is permanently imperfect and so is life and that's just the way it is so i hope that helps no that's, that's amazing and i do agree you know um uh, the the politicians they are trying to do what they can and they they all have their own agendas and all that so uh, obviously yeah, their decision is not very clear cut uh, even when we talk about the media i mean you know they are in the habit of sensationalizing everything and not sort of digging deeper in the in the age of like automatic uh, articles being published and all that. As you said, like the human element has been removed, uh, which needs to be restored. Uh, and and it seems like we are in the middle of the war, which actually leads me to the next question, which is uh, you mentioned this concept of viral bombs. So can you help us clarify that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So think about how COVID starts. It's a single person. One person comes into a country, in in. In the United States, it was apparently someone that came from China into Washington State in mid-January. 
and uh, they they ended up visiting a nursing home. And apparently, from what I can tell, in the state of Washington, which is usually quite moist, they had uh, a weather system come in. And from what I can tell, it was actually in the middle of the night when the viral bomb went off. What is a viral bomb? It's where, you know, COVID, okay, let me back up a step. One person infected with COVID in a single cough can expel 100,000 viral particles into the air with one cough. If they cough 10 times, that's a million viral particles into a room. If the air is dangerously dry, and it's all about indoors, it's not outdoors. The physics of outdoor air are different. Indoors, the, the air is very still. It doesn't move in the same way. And a, 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 when it's dry, a viral particle can go all the way across the room and linger for hours. And so what happens is that people are breathing this invisible danger of a cloud of viral particles indoors and many people get infected and then they go home and don't realize they're infected and they infect others and it's because in part that with covid you don't show symptoms right away we all know this it, it takes at least four or five days usually it may be up to two weeks and and so you can walk around not know you have the virus and infect a whole lot of people and, and when, you, when you multiply that, when you have a, um, uh, like in New York, where there was a period of dangerously dry indoor air that was actually more dangerous than Wuhan for weeks, you had people in indoor spaces infecting many, many other people. And this was a, an exponential rise. That's what a viral bomb is. It's going from a single case or, or a small outbreak to a massive viral catastrophe. And once that happens, it's, it's like a, a nuclear meltdown. Did I answer that clearly? Yeah, that makes sense now. Um, and and uh, now, as we, uh, as we um, suggested, you know, there's this, this interdependency, you know, that, that is coming to surface. You know, this, this, this notion of individuality uh, is sort of melting away because as you said, you know, just, just breathing the air that we breathe, I mean, we share that air, right? Like, it's not like we have an exclusive right to our air and, and uh, somebody else's air is exclusive to them. And then, uh, you know, if we scale it up, it dependencies on neighbors, on cities, on... Well, on, on yeah, it's, it's, it's indoor air, you know, so you share the, the air you're breathing indoors, and if it's super dry, that's where the danger is. Yeah. So, um, so um, let me just mention something while we're before I forget is that that when I mentioned that in moist air, we're less humanly susceptible. We have the Kevlar for, against COVID in our lungs. Well, you can take that with you portably. Let's say you go out, you're visiting a, a, a store or getting on an airplane or going to the mall or around other people. If you hydrate before you leave. Now, as a doctor, I, I, sometimes people hear that They'll take any advice and they'll think, well, a little bit is good, a lot's better. So you don't want to drink too, too much water because you can actually poison yourself from water. But uh, if, you, if you hydrate with, with a, a smart amount of water or Gatorade is even better or something like Gatorade, Powerade or an electrolyte containing drink, because you can take a lot of that and just stay hydrated. And that alone will offer you so much protection against COVID. You can't, it's, it's really important super important so if you're going out stay hydrated and that that will be a, a big protection and and i want to mention something you met you said something about individuality you know we still are in we're not losing ourselves I, I just want to say and there's tremendous hope in the way we're treating each other i am excluding many of the politicians not all of them some of them are doing a great job and they're, and they're very noble and they're telling us the truth and they're transparent but, but the, where we find hope are in these millions of, of quiet acts of courage and human decency and kindness by individuals. And you see it on the front lines. I see it as a doctor. I have not heard of a single case of somebody calling off from work, even though they know every time they go to work, they're not only putting themselves at risk, and there have been ER docs that have died, but their families, because when they come home, they could give something to their families, to the people they love the most in the world. But they do it because it's the right thing to do. 
And that is what out, that's the glue that holds us together. In fact, there's another saying I love, which is that trust in each other is the glue that gets us through. And, and so we see this on the front lines and people are doing the right thing by the millions. And that's where our strength lies. And it's real. It's not fake. And it, it has nothing to do with black or white, gay or straight, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, religious or non-religious. It's just human. And, and it, it's, it, it's, it's totally from here, not from here. And, and so this is very strong and we can count on this. And, and that's when, when you want hope, just look outside, look, look at the way people are treating each other, look at hospitals, look at police and firemen and paramedics and so many people who are bus drivers, people who are putting themselves on the line for each other. That's a commendable job they are doing. I, I don't know whether I will have the courage to be able to do that, but I mean, this, you, would. you would. Yeah. So, you know, once you're in that situation, things change, but this is where I wanted to go where, you know, uh, there's lots of good happening and that, that is true for our world in general. Like, you know, 99% of the time, there's lots of good happening. But the media doesn't report on that because you know it, it doesn't really excite. That's right. They That's report right. on the uh, report on the on the negative and and all that and all the protest protests that are going on, all the divide that is going on. Don't and believe you know, it. Don't believe yeah. it. A lot of it's manipulated. Yeah, but I want to um, talk about this uh, this story uh, that you uh, mentioned, Black Devils, uh, to to demonstrate this point that you know. Uh, that we are one, you know, we need to be united. There's lots of good happening. So will you, uh, will you be able this to share is a that story? beautiful story? Yes. Yeah. I found a secret hidden for a hundred years that changes the way we see race in America and the way we see ourselves. And it's By a way, story. Our, our audience is global. So we are talking to about yes. 200,000 people globally. Yes. And by the way, I, I have a huge following on social media from India and Pakistan. Oh, wow. okay. And I, I just want to throw this in because um, I found uh, through the help of some friends in France, what I believe is the only trace of an East, uh, East Indian, uh, of, a, of a soldier um, in World War I, and they were from, from India. Oh, wow. And it was, I believe it was a doctor, and it's from 1917, I think, or maybe 1916, but it's in France, underground, and he was uh, part of the 34th Puma Horse Regiment, which I believe is near Bombay. And 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 he, you see his handwriting on the on the stone, as if a hundred years ago is is one day. It's so emotional because you feel his humanness. He's writing a note to the future, not knowing if anyone will ever see it. And I got to see that, and and uh, it's amazing. So, um, so what I found, so the big picture is that there is a hidden world of World War I beneath the former trenches of World War I that is all but unknown. It was all but unknown. And, and these were modern underground cities that held tens of thousands of soldiers at any given time throughout the war. There were hundreds of them. And it turns out they were the only places where you could be safe because the uh, this was a high-tech war, and the power of the bombs was was so great that not only would, if, if you were in proximity uh, to a bomb uh, that, that hit on the surface, not only would you die, but there would be nothing left of you. I mean, you would actually disappear. You would vaporize. They were that powerful. And so the underground became a very important place because it was the only place people could find safety and shelter from the, the high-tech war that was happening on the surface that was, that was dehumanizing everything. And so um, uh, in one of these places in 2015, just by accident, it was a place I'd been photographing for, for several years and I'd become friends with the farmer, Phil am friends with the farmer. And, uh, and so, a friend from France noticed that some of the regimental numbers carved on the stone may be, it may have been a, an African-American unit. And, and so it, long story short, because of this, we, 
learned that this was the only trace, it is the only trace of a black combat unit. So I get a meeting with the chief curator of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture in early 2016. And they weren't taking meetings, but because they were trying to get the new museum open, which is a beautiful museum. It's where the exhibit that my work is part of right now is located. It's near the White House in Washington, DC. But they gave me a meeting because they were working on this story that would become the exhibit. And then this guy, you know, emails and says, hey, I found a trace of the story you're working on. I didn't know even they were working on it at the time. And they gave me the meeting. So halfway through the meeting, Dr. Rex Ellis, who was the chief curator of this magnificent museum, politely stops me and said, Jeff, you have stumbled onto I have a dream before I have a dream. And then he said it again. And, and that sounds grandiose, but coming from Dr. Ellis, that was a very big deal. And so what this represents is a story of African-American political power and self-determination that we don't know about. It, it's, it's in essence, what should have happened after the Civil War, and it did. And, and it's almost, it's all but unknown. And so these, this unit wasn't just any unit. This unit was the only all African American unit in the US military with all black officers and all black soldiers. It gets better because 102 years ago when they were fighting so patriotically for our country, that unit was already 49 years old. And so it's a direct link back to this, this um, noble moment of the Civil War and this, this very difficult journey to rehumanize America that began then and that we're still on, but we got stuck along the way. And these soldiers were, were amazing. And it was the way they saw themselves as fully American and fully human. They didn't see themselves as second class anything. And you can see it in their writings. It's not my words, it's their words that, that tell the story. But, but coming back from Washington in March, I was up there uh, doing some television interviews and, and on the plane back, it dawned on me, oh my God, I'd forgotten the, the fact that they, uh, there was a, a Corona connection. So 20 years before World War I, they became the first ever in American history all African-American unit to ever deploy in war. Why? Because they volunteered at the height of a frightening infectious disease pandemic when American soldiers were dropping like flies to go to war, knowing that they were facing almost certain death, but they did it anyway, just like these healthcare providers and police and firemen and all the people right now in COVID, they did the right thing even at the risk of their lives. And their story is remarkable because they show us all how to confront extreme danger together. They, the doctors, the surgeons that ran the field hospitals understood infectious disease. And this is before antibiotics. They were very sophisticated. Because of this, the disease rates plummeted. Countless lives were saved. And, and for this and many other reasons, these African-American soldiers came back as heroes. The commander of the unit was the first colonel in the American military, first African-American colonel. His name was Colonel John R. Marshall. Born a slave, the illegitimate grandson of the longest sitting U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice even through today, his grandfather inaugurated President Thomas Jefferson. And so when he comes back and his unit returns as heroes, he's invited to the White House as a hero. And, and the story goes on from there. But it, they just, they show us what courage and, and, and selflessness is in a moment of great risk. And this is how we will win against Corona. Yeah, I mean, 
That's amazing, and thank you for sharing that. Thank you for uh, discovering it. I wonder how many other stories we lose to history, you know, uh, uh, if it's not uh, for uh, for a tremendous work like uh, people like you. You know, we thank lose you. all this uh, knowledge and, and so much inspiration, and and um, and these these things can shape the you know shape our history, our culture, right? Like if it's you know, there's uh, something I want to say that that the little things happen in life. You never know where, when they're going to happen. You know, for example, I met uh, this, this beautiful soul on a train in France um, in December uh, several years ago. And that person has changed my life. And you never know how a person can touch you. And, and this person, even though I probably will never see them again, they, I feel their presence all the time. You know, there are little coincidences that that come into our lives that, that that change who we are that make us aware of very subtle things and so what as i, I was thinking about uh coming on your show and i'm so honored and so uh appreciative that you invited me manush it, it's that it's that it's the little things that if i were to um note one aspect of 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 the um of the things that i've been able to do and participate in in my life, it's it's paying attention to these little things that surface, and 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 really focusing on them. And so, um, I was talking to a National Geographic photographer, a famous guy named Rick. Uh, um, um, oh gosh, Smolin, um, Smolin, and he he created that that wonderful series, the Day in the Life of the. There's a whole series of books, the Day in the Life of you know India, the Day in the Life of Australia, the you know, it's famous. And, and he asked me, how did I figure out this weather stuff? And I said, Rick, what do we do as Nat Geo photographers? We, we find things that are hidden in plain sight and they're, they can be there for decades, for centuries, and they're just sitting there. And, and it, it's about acknowledging what's hidden in plain sight. And part of it is, is paying attention to your gut, is listening to to those moments and also paying attention to the people like like the person I, I was telling you about that I met on the train, the people that change your life, that touch your life, that are uh, that that inspire your soul, your creativity, your innovation, your energy that lift you up when you're down, you're, the mentors that believe in you and that see you as, as and see your potential and 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 help you through all of the stumbles and the natural, you know, falls on your face that happen. If anyone that's succeeding is falling on their face a lot and also other parts of their anatomy. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure, that's for sure. But I think uh, your message has uh, landed really well. You know, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, you know, if we come together, if we, if we put our differences away and, and, uh, and get curious and, and trust the science, you know, there's so much that can be done, right? Can I just, actually, I have a little different take on that. Okay. So and I, I reply to America. So it's not actually um, uh, it's not actually uh, resolving our differences because I believe that what America is about is being different without killing each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually about it's about our diversity. Exactly. And, yeah, and but but it, it's about it's about putting others um, outside of ourselves. So what I like to say is that that Amer being an American is very simple. It, it, we have one basic responsibility, which is defending of the right of someone, the right of someone that we cannot stand to be who they are, even with our lives. It's their freedom to be who they are. And that means it goes beyond tolerance. It, it actually is, it's not an idea, it's an action. It's something that you do every day. It's about seeing others um, as different. And, and realizing that maybe you can't stand them, that's, that's okay. Because maybe, you know, you're allowed not to stand someone, but you have to accept their right to be who they are. And that's what America, and so when we all do that, that's what American altruism is. So in moments of crisis, we, we see this vast reservoir of human decency and goodness that we forget is there in ordinary life, and it springs forth like a volcano and complete strangers risk their lives to save the lives of complete strangers. It happens every time. 
And, uh, and so that's, that's where hope lies and that's what's happening now. And it will get us through. I'm sure of it. That's great. I mean, this is, uh, this is exactly the kind of message uh, people need to hear. Uh, I, I hope there is more of this. And I hope, uh, you know, everybody watches this and, and everybody watches uh, you on television, wherever you go. Uh, because Thank you. Um, if you can cut through the noise and sort of focus on the facts, I think, as you said, like, I think it's, it's a piece of cake to get through this. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, that big uh, challenge before. It, 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 we are going to get through it. It's going to, and, and most people who get COVID are going to do fine. We have to say that too. That's another positive. So um, it, the, there will be tragedies and those people hopefully will soon have many more therapeutics. And when I'm, I'm talking about something different than a vaccine, therapeutics would be like Tamiflu is for the flu. And so, we are in a period of innovation with science like we have never seen before. You know, we think about NASA and going to the moon and so many inventions coming from that period of time. This is like probably hundreds of times more uh, scientific research and activity and innovation and like we've never seen before. But, but a good part of it is just um, managing our expectation realizing that everything is imperfect, that we're going to have stumbles along the way, that we're going to deal with uncertainty. We can't be selfish, that we're, that some of us are going, a lot of us are going to get COVID actually. And most of us are going to be fine. And if we get it, we have a responsibility. If we get a fever or, you know, to, to quarantine ourselves and to be upfront about it, not to fool ourselves. And if we get tested, can I just mention something about testing? Oh, yeah, it's very really important. Because there's a lot time. You keep going as, as long as you have time. Thank you. There's, there's, a, there, there's something very dangerous about mass testing that we're not being told. There are a lot of things we're not being told, and it's tragic. So as opposed to targeted testing, which is very important, like the testing that's done for people going into nursing homes to make sure, I'm not talking just patients, but the healthcare workers, the plumbers, the electricians, the visitors, Anybody going into a closed space where there are sick people or into prisons or into meatpacking plants, which you don't have sick people, but their, their air is dangerously dry because of the, of the air conditioning and meatpacking plants. Um, the, in any case, those places need testing regularly um, because of the danger of the indoor air. But, but otherwise, except for sampling the population to know if there are you know, outbreaks occurring and, you know, otherwise, in my view, mass testing has a very dangerous side because what it does, especially after we've been cooped up inside and we're dealing with so much uncertainty, we want to feel safe and we want to feel certain. And so we get a test and most of us, in most places, it's 90 to 100 or to 99% of people are going to be negative, even now. Now, New York City is a little different and some other hot spots, but by and large, it's going to be a vast majority of people negative. And they're going to come away thinking they've just had the good housekeeping seal of approval that they're safe. And then they can get it the next hour or the next day, not realize it, and then go hug grandma, who they have been missing and they haven't seen, and give a loved one that they absolutely cherish with all their heart, COVID. And this is the danger. And also the expectations about workplaces. We, you know, we hear about testing to go back to work. To me, that may, does not make sense. And in fact, yesterday or may, no, the day before, there was a news report that really highlighted this. It's amazing. So there were sailors on one of the on the uh, on an American aircraft carrier who got COVID. They were confirmed positive. They were isolated for the uh, uh, mandated amount of time. And then they were tested to make sure that they were over it, which is back-to-back -back testing 24 hours apart with two negative tests. And they all had negative tests in accordance with the protocol. They all come back to the ship and they all got COVID again. These are young, healthy guys. So the, what that tells us is that these antibody tests are kind of meaningless. Um, and, and also that, that um, what the World Health Organization, which I have a lot of problems with, but in this regard, they, I think they're right. They're saying that, that we don't know 
how much immunity COVID confers. If we've had it and do fine, are we going to get it again? It looks like we can. We can also have um, a, a test, an antibody test that is saying that we had it and, and we can still be shedding virus and not know it. So what the workplace, we just have to be socially responsible. If somebody develops a fever, they need to report to their, their supervisor that, that they need to go home. And, and they probably need to be tested because it may not be COVID. And uh, if they're negative, they can come back. But we, we have to get out of this mindset of blame and victimhood. We are not victims. This is a disease that is out of our control. If we get it, it's not because anyone has intentionally given us COVID. Um, it, it, it's not, the spread is not going to stop. We can just flatten the curve. We need to have realistic expectations or, or it's going to drive us crazy. And, and so life goes on. We, this will burn out or, or we'll get a vaccine in time. And between now and then, a, a, a lot of us will get COVID and most of us will do fine. So I hope that helps. We, you know, the workplace in particular, the idea that, that you can immunize a workplace from getting COVID by testing is wrong. And it sets false expectations. And then workers are upset because, you know, some, one of their coworkers got COVID and they're in the workplace and they're exposed and now they're worried. They just need to get over it because we're all at risk of getting COVID no matter what we do. So it seems like therapeutics are, uh, it almost seems like therapeutics need to be higher priority than vaccines. No, they're all high priority. And I believe that, that every aspect of the engines of research right now are in not just overdrive, but like super overdrive, like warp speed you know, to use the Star Trek analogy. I think that we have no idea how much hopeful activity is happening right now with very advanced scientific innovation. And people, it's not just for money. I mean, people have their heart in, in it. They're working, you know, night and day to get these answers. And we're going to have breakthroughs. But in t between now and a vaccine and, and, you know, just make sure your indoor air is green and that you stay... Uh, hydrated, and you're going to be much, 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 much safer, I believe. Awesome. That's great. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on to the show, uh, sharing your insights, and giving some practical tips. You know, uh, there's lots of misinformation, so I'm so glad that you were able to come and you were able to hear from the, from the person in the front lines and get some practical advice. Now, if somebody wants to reach out to you, um, how can they do that? How can they get in touch with you? Well, I really, uh, they, they can go on my website, but I don't, I, I'm, I, I'm so like working night and day. I don't, you know, really, yeah. I can't do medical advice or, and I'm sorry, yeah. I wish I could. Yeah. I'd be honored for people to go on my website if they want to follow me. Most, the most um, vibrant platform right now is LinkedIn because I'm putting, I'm posting all the interviews or most of the interviews and I'm doing a lot of them and the press releases and the news stories. And I think we're just at the tip of an iceberg because I think that this humidity story is going to come out and then it's going to explode. And we're going to be in, in almost like a war footing like we were with ventilators and uh, with PPE six, eight weeks ago to get every place green, the air indoor green quickly. And, and they're going to have to uh, adjust the thermo or the humid humidity and get HVAC companies involved with buildings and, and it, it, it's doable. But anyway, I, so I, but you know, if you reach out, like you can, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm on, I don't do Twitter too much, but I'm on there. Uh, somebody helps me with it. Um, Instagram. Uh, I usually respond to those and I try to respond personally. So you can, and, and also uh, if you want to hear a really moving, interview about the black devils it's amazing the the journalist did an incredible job it just came out on friday it was on national public radio and you can hear it on my linkedin page uh, or on facebook i think and and it was just one of the best interviews and and she was able to piece together all the different elements of the story and there's a lot of background on the unit it was a beautiful job i mean when journalists uh 
put their heart into telling the truth and being and using their skills. Oh my God, it's such an important part of modern life. Media can be a godsend. So uh, I just want to say that positive note. And 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 one last last thing for everyone around the world listening: be hopeful and and do the little things. Try as hard as you can every day to make many other people feel humanly safe. You may not be thanked for it, that you may, you'll never be acknowledged most of the time, but it's all the little things that we do for each other that most of the time no one will ever know about that are the glue that will get us through. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.